Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to B&H's The Studio. We're here to discuss picking the right camera and lens uh, and which systems are good for the right task. Uh, we are obviously here at a show that is full of cameras and lenses, and we have a great group of panelists. Um, to the, f I guess on the far l right, I stage left, I don't care. <laughs> I don't do this. Um, we have Larry Thorpe with Canon. Next Hello. That's good. Your mic works. I didn't do that. <laughs> Next to Larry is Ted Kenny from Fox Sports. Hello. And next Hello. to Ted is Don Sperling from the New York Giants. Hi, everyone. And then we're stuck with Jeff Jacobs from MTV Viacom. Greetings. He's on his phone uh, already, looking at his get notes. Get me down. Sorry. Get me down. Anyway, so let's get started with, uh, well, Jeff, let's start with you. Is that okay? Yeah, please. Uh, you know, obviously you have shows like the VMAs and lots of also, you know, some martial arts shows and all kinds of things using interesting cameras. You got a viewership that they love cool toys. They may not always care about quote unquote high quality. They want guerrilla style camera images and authentic images. So how do you guys go about choosing cameras for the right kind of jobs? And like the VMAs, how many types of cameras are you using as far as getting different looks and different feels? Okay, Ken, I'll answer the question this way. At the VMAs, there's actually four shows going on. There's the main show, which is comparable to most any Super Bowl type show, Academy Awards, Grammys. Of course, you have all your traditional HD camera and lens complements, uh, as in any traditional large tentpole Super Bowl type show. However, three shows down the line, you've got the main show, the red carpet, and then the backstage digital show. The backstage digital show, if the main show has 15 cameras, the backstage show for .com actually has about 24 cameras. Wow. Because whereas instead of just being one, two, or three stages, there is 15 dressing rooms and hallways and green rooms where we have backstage and we can take the viewer and further engage them in the program by taking them backstage. Those cameras are traditionally those little Sony systems where it has a joystick and eight buttons and one guy is, one operator is working uh, eight cameras at a time, much like what B&H has set up here. So, it goes not to lens size and glass in as much as content. In closing, we at Viacom and the Viacom Media Networks, we produce shows from a VMAs to a Bellator mixed martial arts, but we've always felt it's not necessarily, again, the size of the glass in as much as the content, because we're storytelling and we're projecting content to our viewers. They'd rather have better content, which might be a small camera in some places, than lesser content and a big piece of glass. So you mentioned uh, being backstage and uh, smaller cameras. Do they have to be more discreet? I mean, because, for example, if, it's, if the camera is obviously a camera, do the people act differently? Is it better when it's more discreet in the corner, like a security camera? Or? It's funny you say that. We did a show at Radio City. We actually took feeds of their security cameras, including the one in the elevator. So between acts to bust a commercial pod, we'd show the security camera in the elevator. And, so, and Beyonce's going up in the elevator. Stay tuned to Mr. Beyonce. Look, she's in, the dr she's in the dressing room. We do the same thing at our Bellator fights, which are on Spike every Friday night at 9, live, and then USA on Saturday nights. And, um, and yes, you'd want them obscure and smaller. Um, and we've been putting cameras just about everywhere. In, in fact, Ken, right now, I'm wearing a camera, and I'm, viewing, and I'm shooting you. How are you? The button camera? I can't tell you. All right, okay. Well, <laughs> and let's be honest. Anytime, anytime the words Beyonce and elevator, you usually want to try to get those shots anyway, because odds are something might happen that's going to be interesting and newsworthy. And for that reason, you record every line in, just in case. A little death watch camera. You have 25 cameras, right. record them all, that, which is even more important than the glass. Record every single camera, because maybe you'll have a fight, maybe you'll have an instance, and that's your social, and that's your social bite tomorrow that's going to trend. Right. Yeah. Right. So you know, Don, that, oh no, I'm just. Uh, it's funny he said that because I was just talking to someone yesterday. Because um, back in the day, I produced the Real World for MTV, and I came in after Vegas. So there's a Vegas show, and I went and did Paris. And the the ultimatum was record everything because in Vegas, someone threw a fork at someone's head, mm. and they missed the shot, and the cast talked about it for the whole show, but they didn't have the shot. So record everything, put cameras everywhere. I agree with Jeff. It's you can certainly. Go to Larry and get the, the new UHD uh, 86. I'm going to show for him. The new UHD 86 by lens, but you can't afford it. You can't put it in the back or anything. But if you can put up 15 cameras, people will watch anything as long as the story or the content's there. Doesn't matter, black and white, 
rainy, doesn't matter. Are your pylon cameras, at the, am I allowed to ask a quick question? Sure. Are your pylon cameras at the Super Bowl always recording? Yes. So that's genius. Oh, absolutely. Even if the ball's on the other side, you don't know Stuff if something's going to happen. And, and if you have a social media PA just watching them, you never know you could be the luckiest guy in America. All right, so uh, Super Bowl this year, something happened in the dressing room, as we all know. It's awesome. Those cameras outside the dressing room, inside the dressing room, outside the AFC and NFC dressing rooms, continually recorded throughout. And, wow. and that's what led to the capture of this. That's, that's, that's amazing. Because we, that's this beautiful. was at, two hours after the game, our cameras were still recording. Right. Wow. Well, there's actually, during, uh, on somewhere, one of the Fox FS1 shows, they showed all the video that was used to find yep. the, the gentleman who stole Tom Brady's jersey. And they actually used the 8K camera that was in the corner and zoomed in to show him right. taking selfies on the field because he was there during the celebration. And then they right. showed him walking off the field and then they picked him up to your point in the tunnel. And so that was the hard part is, is we, we knew what he looked like. We knew at one point from a camera angle where he was. So I went to Ebert's uh, and, and viewed the 4K footage on a 4K monitor. And we basically panned and scanned for three hours looking for a needle in a haystack. And once we found him, in the middle of the field, we could backtrack and watch him where he entered the field. And what's amazing about that shot is if you look at that shot, it looks like we had a camera on this guy walking to the field. And it was a high, wide 8K camera, and we tracked him throughout the whole field. <laughs> so, so like a 24 awesome. episode, like Jack, yes. Jack yeah. Bauer <laughs> right. found this guy, you know? Exactly. <laughs> nice. So, Don, walk us through, because the Giants, uh, well, first of all, give people a sense, because people wouldn't hear that you do the Giants. They're going to think just in venue game day. But you guys have a full right. slate yeah. of content uh, that's created all during the week. So maybe give a sense of what you guys do during the week, how you roll through, and then yeah. what kind of camera systems you use to get different types of moods. Well, one of the unique things, and a lot of teams are doing it now, we've always put all the media platforms under one roof. So digital, social, television, game day entertainment, producing the game, uh, creative services, radio, everything falls under one roof. So we have the same shooters, editors, all working for, for all, the, all, the, all the products. So it does, it does involve a lot of different cameras and some of the conundrums that we run into are the mixing and matching of the cameras and the lenses. Because, you know, so we shoot with a Sony F55, but sometimes you can't get too close because if we're using a, a lens, so we have one of the lenses on a Cabrio lens, but, uh, you know, on that, <laughs> I'm sorry. But I'm just giving an example, but the, but the problem is that if you get too close, okay, to the, uh, to the action, and I'm going to give you a great example of what happened, if you get too close, you're going to miss it because you have to step back and wide. So one of our guys has um, Mike Mike Becton, who's one one of our bet our main shooter and producer, for the catch. And everybody, most people are familiar with Odell Beckham's catch against the Dallas Cowboys, which is known as the catch. Mike Becton's angle was incredible. Okay, he has it from behind, perfectly framed, the hand going up, everything, along with NBC's, you know, all their angles. But when you look from the front you don't see Becton in the shot. You would think that after you saw the shot, you would see him. He actually, when, when Becton came, when Becton ran down the sideline, he automatically, instinctively, took like 10 steps backwards and shot it, and he was out of frame, so from the front angle, you, you would think, oh, if, if he's in that, he must be in the shot, and he wasn't, because he knew to back up 10 feet to get to capture the shot. Mm. We sometimes, the issue that we have is we, have, we, have F, we shoot on F7s, we shoot on F55s. We have inherently some old 700s that we still have that we're gonna be slowly replacing. We also shoot with EX300s, we shoot obviously all, all Sony. And we even, you know, use the Osmo, okay? And we follow guys, I mean, for, it depends. If it's for social media and digital media, we're using smaller, more mobile, more cameras that can get up close and not really, as Ken said, be obvious and get in the players' faces. For action and for the things at the stadium, like for instance, we just bought two uh, Sony 4300s for our slash positions, and I went to my owner and said, the reason we want to buy these cameras, and we went and bought the EVS Super Slow Mo replay system so we could zoom in at 4K, stop, get that replay on the board and change the mind of the ref and turn over the calls. And I guaranteed my owner that I'd change four calls a year 
with that camera. You can see the blade of grass, the guy's foot, and the football when you zoom in. And we, and, but obviously you have to have a great operator. An operator had it up within seconds. So it's a, it's, it's a mix and match, and you have to kind of figure out what the right rig is. And the, I mean, it's not as easy as getting a great camera. You have to have the right lenses. You have to have the, you know, the shoulder harness in the right way if you're going to be mobile, or you have to have the right camera for shooting a game. So what about for like the player profiles and, and what are you using? Yeah, we're DSLRs using more cinema, cinematic like cameras. We use our F7s and F55s, you know, swap out lenses. We, we use the Osmo. We'll use, um, for our media veils, we'll use the EX, small EX cameras. And we're slowly replacing them with 4K and smaller and, and smaller rigs that we can get with the players. We give players cameras. We use a lot of GoPro. We do a lot of time lapses. Oh. Um, you know, every, anything to get behind the scenes. As everyone knows, it's shorter. We're, tra we're migrating our television shows more to digital now. We're killing TV shows. We're, we're doing shorter, more to the point, you know, on Facebook Live, on, on, on social. It's really about access. And when you do access, you have to have it from, it has to be a two-way conversation. It has the players have to have a point of view, and you have to have the point of view. Now, uh, you mentioned Facebook Live. Do you use phones then, or are you yes. also shooting other content? Yes, and, and we're looking around now, and you know, especially here and, and places to figure out the best way because you know, we found out that 16 by nine is not preferable, it's square to, you know, to do that. And we're learning a lot of stuff and what the consumers want to see, what's easier to see, and what's more accessible. And Facebook Live, I mean, the NFL has limitations on what you can do, they only allow you um, X amount of Facebook, they have deals with Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter and Instagram, as we all know, and you're restricted in the amount of footage you can use off the field, you, you can use, you can do whatever you want, but on footage-wise, so, you know, we have to also work within the, as you know, <laughs> within the constrictions of the NFL, you know, the... <laughs> <You're almighty. laughs> <laughs> well, you, in December at our summit in New York, you, you, someone from your team showed the video that you guys took on the field before practice that was done with, obviously, a cell phone. Um, and it had, an, you know, there were some dropouts. It had, but it, so it felt very Real. authentic. For, yeah. So do you get concerned that, uh, about quality in those situations? I mean, would you like better quality? Does it not really matter because it's good storytelling? Yeah. I mean, Ideally, you would want, you always want the best quality. I mean, why are we buying 4K? Why are we talking about 8K? Okay, however, access is still, access pushes everything. And as, as yeah. what you did in, in the Super Bowl, it's all about storytelling, it's all about content. Any way you can get the shot, get it. Worry about that later. If ultimately you can get, you know, the, the highest quality and, and edit it short enough so the millennials and Gen Z can absorb it, then all the better. Mm -hmm. So Ted, maybe from the Fox Sports perspective, um, obviously <laughs> you cover the gamut of events and things. So how do right. you guys go about, uh, again, for base, for, I call it, there's no basic production for you guys, but right. you know, what, what are some of your key tools that you guys rely on all the time? For well, I, I mean, a big one, I mean, like you just spoke about the 4300, which I hope we can tap into when we come to a game there. You do. Okay. Uh, by the way, Rich Russo yeah. and Rich Zions produce my direct and produce my preseason games, and they're part of the family. Right. So when Rich comes, I move my slash to the lower, the lower level, portion, right. so he takes, right. I, always give, I always give Russo my slash position. Right. Love it. So, um, and yes, you can tap into anything you want. All right, <laughs> deal's done. Nice. <laughs> um, I mean, ultimately, we're looking at, uh, the, the most important thing for us is having the ability to uh, pan and scan, basically zoom in, you know, crop and, and look at, you know, because football's a game of inches. So that's, that's what people are looking for. I mean, you, you definitely have the, the, the typical shots, the high 50, the, the, the slash positions, but it's about getting that player's, sometimes it's about getting the immersive experience of a player's expression. Sometimes it's about did he cross the line or not. So for us, it's all about the rules of the game. That's why we added pylon cameras this year. And that's also why, if, if, if you watch the Super Bowl, the pylon cameras on most shows were pointed straight down the line, straight up the line. This year, for the Super Bowl, we brought them at an angle more, so you had more of the field, uh, and you could actually play three of them in a row and capture someone going through each frame. So there's, there's things that we look at, and, and lensing's a huge part of it for us. Um, you know, 
I, I, there was a panel yesterday that Larry and uh, Mike Davis never were on, and it's, it's funny because when you start looking at details for anything, don't forget the details of getting the right camera with the right lens when it, when it comes to the game situation. Now, when we go backstage for digital, I'm not going to use an F55 to throw on the internet. I'm just, I mean, if we have content that we shot in the game or shot with an F55, certainly we could push it to the internet, but it's not necessary these days. Um, and, and the fact is, somebody, when you're talking about the Facebook Live and how it was uh, chopped up or it lost signal, there's good editors out there that get paid $5,000 you know, a week to actually put that in the video. <laughs> right? So that's, that's real. I mean, using your phone and going Facebook Live, that's real stuff. And it's immediate and it's impactful. Um, so we, we, it works. As long as there's content, as long as the story's there, I, I think millennials and anyone young will eat it up. So obviously all of you have done uh, red, let's start with, because I know I've, not everybody's doing football games. So let's start with like red carpet situations. Um, is there any? Is there a basic configuration they just use for for red carpet shows? That's very simple. I'm guessing nothing too fancy and trick, tricky. Why Every, is everyone ones? is different. Everyone is different. Our last red carpet, we shot live virtual reality, and we were sitting in our first creative meeting six months out. I'm like, let's not even do VR live on the red carpet unless we are doing a red carpet conducive to 360 degree VR. So I, I so said, something nice behind you. I said, don't give me a red carpet and then put a pole there. Uh, let's build a red carpet in the shape of the, like the Lululemon logo. You know the Lululemon logo? Mm -hmm. I know it because um, I know <laughs> the Lululemon logo because on Saturdays when I go to Temple, all the women, they bring a Lululemon bag with their heels and they get to the temple and they put the heels on <laughs> from the Lululemon bag. So I'm like, build That's us a funny. Lululemon, bring us a Lululemon <laughs> logo red carpet and we'll put one in the middle. And we did. Um, so, did so, they pay you? So um, the, the Lululemon or the women with the heels? The lemon. No, we got nothing. So, um, so the answer to your question is everyone is different. Uh, you know, some carpets we've had sky cams and some we've had techno jibs. Ted, you, know, you guys had a red carpet at the Super Bowl, so that was a, that was that anything fancy there? It's pretty straightforward. Well, too. I mean, I, I worked on uh, two VMAs back in the '90s, and, and we've had red carpets for Super Bowl and other shows. And it, it, you know, it's it's director driven, it's handheld driven, jib, you know, to get the overview or the scope of the project. Uh, it really comes down to to lensing most of the time. You know, how wide do you want the lens? Uh, what's your focal point? You know, how big's the red carpet? You know, how to make it look bigger if you're a smaller red carpet? There's just, there's a lot of things that go into that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So Larry, maybe, because uh, obviously you probably get asked the question all the time, what kind of camera, what kind of lens, how do they get matched together? So when you, in terms of some general tips, how do you, uh, how do you in your brain, sort of, you know, the right camera with the right lens? And well, I we always advocate testing, because uh, we get, inputs that can be quite different, but we need to know where the cameras are going to be placed, what's the angles of views that they're looking for, and that can vary all over the map. So we always say test, don't make the wrong decision. Now there are some people who are so expert, they know immediately what they want, they just say, I want an 86 by whatever it is. But uh, new stadiums and people talking about new positions and that, we always say, let's put the lens and the camera together and test it. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's Probably no short not. circuit to that. So, so when you look at the, you know, how do you, for a Canon, for the DSLRs, so how would you describe their use and what kind, and what kind of story they tell as far as emotionally the, the types of images that you get from that? Yeah, well, the DSLR sort of plunged into the, the game because of that large sensor and the extreme shallow depth of field and that cinematic look at a very low cost. And that just grabbed everybody. It grabbed people in the news department, the news magazine, sports. Uh, and that's really what it is. Usually it inserts, uh, carefully focused, so you catch this subject and everything else is out of focus. And uh, people love that look. Mm -hmm. and is that uh, purely, uh, we should probably talk a little about full frame sensor and then the two thirds inch sensor. And so, that's yeah. so do you, how would you describe the different looks that you get from a different sensor? Because that's a big decision. A lot of people overlook that, I think, when they... Yeah, well, the, the sensor size is the first determinant of your depth of field, because you, you, a certain sensor size, that determines what's going to be projected by the lens, 
and that determines uh, focal lengths in the lens, and it's as simple as that. Two-third inch, typically long depth of field, large format sensor, very short, Super 35, somewhere in between, APS, the various APS, C, H, there are variants in all of that. And there, there are people skilled in that, they know what they want, they know their framing, and they know basically uh, the, the, the depth of fields that they're looking at. Also, how about, now how about as far as the, um, when you use a two-thirds inch sensor, if you want to shoot wide, you want a full frame. If, if shooting wide is important, you want a full frame sensor, right? Because if you shoot two-thirds, you get some zoom magnification. Well, is that more uh, for still or is that for video also? No, two-third no, two inch, you can get extremely wide uh, today. We have a, a 4.3 millimeter that gives you 90-something degrees. So uh, uh, it, it's all a question of the focal length that you put in. So when you have people, I know a lot of people are grappling with this on all levels. Uh, do, they, should, do they go 4K? Do they save some money and go HD only? What's your sense for a small to medium size production? Well, let's, let's start with the small. Let's go through, you know. Yeah. Where should, what should their considerations be? Um, should they go 4K or should they still stick with HD? If well, the, the, the bit about should they go is a, is a, is a, a, big, a big question. Uh, it's, it's a state of flux right now. There's a lot of people, they're shooting HD, they're scratching their heads and they're, they're hearing all this buzz about 4K. They may have clients who are saying, I want that cinematic look. And you look around and you see all of us are now making, all of the latest generation of cameras are multi-format. They switch between HD, 2K cinema, UHD or 4K, four formats, all standardized. And that's become the norm. So people who are going to buy a new camera will buy a multi-format multi camera. That way they shoot what they want today and they can switch immediately to if they get a, a client who says, I want something done in 4K. And that's, that seems to be the norm in all the latest and the, 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 the OB trucks, the mobile trucks, they're buying multi-format cameras. Now I'm going to guess, and maybe you, you guys have had this experience, I'm sure, over the years. The less experience people have as a, from a client standpoint, they're probably more apt to say they want 4K or they want HD or VR. I mean, so do you think that in terms of a business, if you were doing a business and you were looking to get business, that 4K is, is the investment to make because you will guarantee you won't be able to turn the customers off? I, again, you know, just to earlier to your point, I really think it's the end user and I think what's now the popular flow is the rig. Okay, so for instance, we were talking earlier to some of the B&H people here. There's that company, DJI, and they make the Osmo. Okay, we use that when we're following a player from the field to the locker room or on the field or we want to get up close. It's a, you're holding with one hand and it's small and you're following him. Now, if you're doing a feature shoot and, we want to f and a player is working out and he's pushing a sled in the gym and the sweat, we can hook, they have this new rig called the Ronin. And you, not new, but they, they've now did, uh, have a bigger one. You can take the FS7 camera, hook that up onto this Ronin mm. and shoot this and it gives you this perspective <clears throat> that the viewer feels like they're a voyeur, they're a fly on the wall. The Osmos are fly on the wall. Okay. We have rigs for the players. Like when we go to the Pro Bowl, <laughs> the big thing for us at the Pro Bowl is not the game that's secondary, obviously. It's the week of all the practices. Every day, not only are players wearing a wireless mic, they're wearing a GoPro camera on a, on a body rig. And you're getting, so they're running, and we're intercutting that with action. So you're seeing Odell Beckham run down and, you know, the ball coming, and he's catching the ball, and you're seeing it from the quarterback's view or from the defender's view. And we're giving our viewers this point of view because of rigs. Okay, yes, the cameras and the lenses and everything have to be great and have to be the right ones and have to be small or large or for whatever you need. But these rigs and these holders and these harnesses, everything is becoming critical to getting the content out that our end users need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the most important for, for anyone getting involved, if a, a client comes to them and says what they want, you, you sort of have to figure out where, where's it going? What's the end product? Where's it going? I mean, if you're just going to put it on YouTube, there's no reason to shoot it in 4K at this moment. Oh. If, if, if you don't have money behind you to put it somewhere, but that's always the first question you ask the client. What's the in-use product? Now, if they want to future-proof, 
for the future, that's different if they want a future future proof. But but ultimately, where's it going? Um, and a lot of times, they don't even know. It's so why shoot it in 4K at that moment? Yeah, Facebook will only take up to 720. <laughs> I mean, you can't. Right. You can't shoot any higher. Right. Okay. Uh, now YouTube will take 4K, but right. you're right. It's a waste. It, it, it's just a waste at that point. Right. I mean, if you're going to the theater, and you're going to absolutely. So Larry, thankfully at Canon, you do both cameras and lenses, so I can ask this question of you. <laughs> um, should people invest, again, we're not going to talk you know, big organizations and rental companies, which is one whole different thing. Uh, in terms of time and money, are you better off investing more money in high quality lenses or save money on a lens but get a better camera? I know there's a lot of variables in there. But what's your sense on what has more longevity and, and is a better, safer investment long term? Well, the, camera, the cameras are pretty amazing today. They're, they're, they're all very high quality. Uh, the lens, the ultimate image you get is greatly determined by the lens. And then when you talk about the dynamics of the lens and focal ranges and all that sort of thing, image quality can change over that focal range. So you need to get lenses that will sustain an image quality, especially in the really long lenses. Um, Investing today in this quandary of the industry and the fact that there are multi-format cameras, you're buying a camera, you know you're going to shoot for the next two or three years. If you're going to buy a lens, I certainly would be advocating to buy a 4K lens because you're going to get far better HD now and you're going to be future-proofed. And the lenses typically have a much longer life than the cameras. And when you say their value would hold up too? I mean, yes. you, you know, cameras are dropping in prices all the time. And yes, your, your lens, lens, lenses, we I don't, still see we lenses don't drop the price old, too quickly. If you don't have good glass, then you, yeah. the camera, you can get as good a camera as you want. Yeah. The glass stinks, you're cooked. Right. Yeah. 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 So, and, and, and that's interesting because I always look at, I, I had a lens stolen once, a nice uh, Canon lens. It wasn't a super, it wasn't a super nice Canon lens, but it was a 7200. And then we got some insurance money and then we reinvested and we got the red line lens. And, and we also got much more sensitivity, and it was like night and day as far as yeah, the, the ability be. to shoot in darkness. And yeah. you were just like this, you know, like you watch these golf tournaments, <clears throat> a lot of times when they're playing in the dark and then you're watching on TV and it doesn't look that dark, but then they're just, you know, they're opening it up so much and, and they're letting yeah. so much light that, that they're actually playing in the dark and it doesn't translate at home. There, there's another aspect too today, because again, this flux that we have out there, HD or UHD, HDR, HDR with UHD, HDR with 1080p. The lens is the first footprint on HDR. This is not very well understood. Uh, you have to remember HDR is taking you two directions, way up, speculars, and also going down to get deep shadows. This is your HDR. Lenses, as more speculars come in, you don't want to mess them up with optical artifacts, and cheap lenses will. Going down, you've got to be able to reproduce blacks much better to get that deep black from the lens. That's optical coatings. And that issue of designing HDR considerations into a lens is very new. It's really only been happening with the 4K lenses. And that's another reason to think about 4K lens if you're going to do HDR on, on 1080p. So when you're looking oh, at good. a spec sheet, are, where are those for lens? Are the is there a number that shows you how high it's you, going to you, be in you, No, you will never see such specs on lens. Uh, the only specs we put out in all of us in our brochures are the operational specs, the wide angles, the focal ranges, the minimum object distance. Performance specs never published. A, because they're so dynamic. They change every time you change focus, change uh, uh, focal length, or the subject moves, uh, resolution is changing. All sorts of things are right. changing, minutely, but right. it's a lot of data. So there's no way to know whether you're getting the lens that, that gives you that inherently, or? Test. Testing. Test. Okay. Gotcha. So let's go on, on to the VR movement, which is obviously you guys have done a lot of work with VR, and those camera systems are a whole different conversation. Um, where, where, what's your approach towards picking the right VR camera, rig? What are you looking for out of a, a VR experience? You mentioned the 360 and the red yeah. carpet, but. So, um, <clears throat> so I have a different opinion than I, I, I bet from other people. Uh, yeah. For us, whether it's entertainment or sports, VR is a tool for further storytelling. Not coverage, not live coverage, it's yet another streaming tool for telling 
more stories our viewers would otherwise not be privy to. Is that why you said you don't want to put a stick with the VR camera and then it's just in, in the red carpet, that's not enough for you? Um, that I would call coverage, unless we're putting narrative to it and telling a story. Um, I noticed that Michelle from B&H has that big jaunt top on the pole um, over, over there. Um, look how um, large it is and, um, and how many lenses are on it. Um, a lot of people would call that a pro camera. Uh, what, uh, what IM360 and, and Live VR and, and all these other companies, they're pro VR companies. Uh, I feel very, very comfortable with prosumer products when it comes to VR. I feel very comfortable with prosumer VR products because, again, like we've talked about, it's not always the size of the glass or the camera, but the content. With prosumer VR, 360 VR cameras, they're small enough and versatile enough that we can tell the story and further engage our viewers. And once again, that's our main objective. So if it's Bellator, mixed martial arts, for example, um, we don't do live coverage because if you want live coverage, turn on TV and with the 16 cameras, they do a nice job. You can get your coverage. Um, but for VR for that, for example, we'll be in a locker room an hour before the fight and you'll be able to see the fighter and then you could see his wife over there like this and then you could see Paulie wrapping the mouthpiece and, and the other guy and the kid playing the video yeah. game. So you're now telling a new story, <coughs> you're telling a new story about what's going on and then we'll sometimes put a prosumer 360 VR camera on a pole and follow the fighter out, a little bit of a POV, down to the, down to the, uh, the announcement and then down. You never see that in broadcast, but it, again, we're telling a different story of what's going on. You see the crowd, you see the priest, you see Paulie, you see the fighter. It's just another storytelling mechanism. Uh, so, so that's how we we utilize VR. So do you find the prosumer is, uh, is it acceptable because even with the greatest VR camera rig, by the time it gets to the home, to the viewer through the glasses and the resolution that, that a lot of that quality falls off? Is that what part of that is? If you're is asking me if, if prosumer is adequate, then my answer would be for storytelling, yes. But, you know, live coverage, it's a different story. Right. We're finding, and we do more research and development with VR than so much trial and error because we can, um, placement is key. Placement, placement, pla location, location, location. So if we put it in front of a band on the lip of a stage so you can see the audience 180 degrees and the band 180 degrees, because the lenses on these prosumer models are just not great, then you're not going to see the drummer's face or even the sticks clear enough or the bass, or even the kids in the front row or the fourth row. But placement, 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 if we take it and we put it right into the drum riser, right in the middle of it, some of our best stuff is like that, then yet another one, because prosumer, less expensive, so we could afford three to one. So then another one by the bass guitar, and then another one in the crowd, and then cut them together in post, tell a new story, that's where we score. Right. It so, so save so save money, I and mean, you can invest it into additional cameras to improve the storytelling from different angles and what have I'd you. rather have three prosumer cameras on a shoot than one pro camera, because it helps us tell that story. Right. So Ted, I know you've done a lot of uh, VR. Yeah. You know, and and uh, what I find fascinating about the the Fox evolution, if you will, is is the strategy sort of changed and evolved a little bit. And you guys are looking at all kinds of ways, but maybe dis discuss. The Fox, v current mm. Fox VR philosophy and how you're approaching 360 versus 180 versus, right. again, storytelling. and Well, it's, it's very similar to Jeff's. I mean, if it's never going to be coverage of a game. It's it just not. I mean, we, we could certainly have done coverage of a game, but it's not going to be what you expect from a 2D coverage. Um, when we watch TV, we sort of lean back, we relax. You have the story being told to you. And for VR, it's, it's sort of immersive, so you, it's, a, it's a lean forward, not as so much as gaming, but a little bit lean forward because you're immersed in an environment, and you're immersed in what's going on. But early on, we, um, what was important to us, well, what's important to everyone is, is stereoscopic 360 live, which we're not there yet. Um, so we were doing a lot of 180 stereoscopic with Next VR, and what was important for us was, and, and I, I have to disagree a little bit, is we were, pixel counting. We were pixel counting and frame counting. We wanted high frame rate. We wanted the best pixels. So NextVR had two Dragon cameras that they were shooting with, 180. Uh, and, and by the time we got it through the system and up into the bird and back down, 
it was crisper than if I took a Samsung Gear camera out there. Uh, and actually, at that time, Samsung didn't even have their camera out. So, uh, so it allowed us a little bit of flexibility as far as uh, control, paint control on the cameras, a little bit of everything. And then as we moved forward, one of the things we noticed was, and this was when we were shooting live sports, so we're shooting like the US Open. You could pick a hole. You could go anywhere you want. Um, but what we did notice is that you know, people aren't going to stay in the glasses for a game. If anyone tells you they're going to give you the best seat in the house at a basketball game and put one mid-court, obviously they haven't watched enough basketball because it's not the best seat in the house, first of all, because the best seat in the house is at the foul lines. Um, and, and you don't want to do this the whole time. And you don't hear an announcer. and You don't have a story. You don't have a replay. So, so ultimately, it's about entertainment value, and it's, which goes to storytelling. So we've been using Live Like a lot, which is, gives you the 360 atmosphere. It's augmented reality behind you. It's in 2D on the front side. You can choose any camera you go to. Uh, we also have a produce feed where we lead you maybe around a NASCAR track as the race is happening. But we also give you stats. We give you uh, player or driver stats. If you turn around in the 360 atmosphere, we've got different magic windows where you can look at the top 10 plays from Fox Sports. You can look at a player featurette. So it's the entertainment value wrapped in one that people are actually staying for. So we do a lot of VOD, which is story driven. Uh, keeping it between about 30 seconds and then about uh, 30 seconds to about minute 30 to two minutes, no longer than that. Because again, you just want to capture someone's attention so they come back. But you don't see people wearing these for hours, and, and I don't expect to. Don from the Giants. Yeah, I mean, we're, we don't do VR yet. Um, we're entertaining all the vendors. We've got a lot of amazing presentations. Our biggest issue is for our fan base is obviously it's not scalable in terms of the presentation of, of what, what we'd like to do. So there's really no scale and we've kind of we've kind of wrestling with that issue because we serve a large fan base and, and so forth. However, what I do think and what we've really found is that for the presentations, for a sales presence, if, if you're going out, let's say one of our key uh, sponsors is leaving and we're trying to entertain a big sponsor or we're trying to get Pepsi back or Bud or someone, why not create a VR presentation where you literally put, you go in the room, you have the four people from, you know, you're renewing with Pepsi, you put the, you, you put the, on That's them, it. and <laughs> you give them the locker room, you give them the, the runway, you give them the hallway, you give them the field, and you say, you want to come into this, into the stadium and advertise? This is what it feels like. For a specialized, sponsored presentation, we think it's very valuable. For, a, for specialized fan events, we think it's very val uh, valuable. For coverage, we're trying, we're wrestling with that on scalability. So we have about a minute left, so let's kind of try to recap a little bit. So for social video, um, it's okay to be using cameras, making it look like it's authentic. That's probably the most important thing. You don't need to be shooting with a 4K camera. Correct. Um, if you have clients, if you're in a rental, or, sorry, in a situation where you're, you're looking for clients and, and making sure you can attract as many clients as possible, potentially 4K should be a consideration to make sure that you can at least grab as many potential clients and you could see the return on investment of that. You're also protecting your brand protect in, in that sense. Your brand needs to look good. Your players, your colors, your trademarks. In that sense, yes. Uh, uh, the, most important, the most important part about attracting any clients is be good at what you do. Be the best at what you do. Because that's what happened in 3D. You had all these gentlemen who built 3D cameras who never had shot in 2D in their life. <laughs> Ever. They were scientists. And, 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 you know, so you look at their IMDb page or anywhere else, look at their resume, it's like they've never shot a show in their life, yet they were saying they're the best company and camera company that it was. So just be good, even if you're using, I don't know, a, uh, an old Sony handheld camera you bought 20 years ago. Be good at, at that camera. Right. I guess we have about 10 seconds left on those oh, lines. Sorry. You're better off. You're better off sticking with a camera and a lens that you understand how to get the most out of it rather than buying a camera that's sort of out of your league that makes you feel like you know what you're doing, but you're really kind of confused. Yes, Agreed. right. Agreed. Right. Agreed. Excellent. Well, thanks, everybody. We're going to wrap Thank up you. right here. And, and uh, be sure to stop by the B&H booth to check out all the latest gear and technology and lots of cool cameras. So thanks, everybody.